Welcome to each and every one of you. On behalf of UCM's Universal Church of the Masters educational team, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us tonight for an incredible event. And that is the experience of Sonia Sharma and her experience is truly being a world citizen and bringing the richness from her culture of origin across the hemispheres, as we've said, to America and allowing us to share at that fountain of wisdom and to really gain an understanding of the deep spiritual traditions. And just so that everyone knows, if you can mute yourself, that would be great. If everyone can mute themselves, because that way, when we you know, start to hear uh, Sonia, all of us will be muted and we will not be you know, interrupting her process and her wisdom sharing. Thank you for that, Donna. And, you know, as we think about these incredible times that we are in, it is so amazingly difficult for people and also amazingly transformative for people. And this particular day, this particular time of year is very special in Sonia's tradition. And I was so grateful to hear that she's choosing to spend this time with us, giving us you know, her experience and her bridge building work that she has done. So I just can't tell you how grateful we are because this energy is very powerful. And as we harness that light and that energy, and as we build that for and with each other, it is amazing. And we have a tradition at our educational programs of lighting the candle and my brother, before he died, taught me how to do the origami heart and the origami crane. And I made a heart today in honor of Sonia with just a flame of, of light. That's what it just felt like we needed. And, um, and so what I will do is light the candle, but I'm going to invite Lynn as we share a wish for today and as we introduce Ms. Sonia more fully. So can we take a deep breath and bring our attention into this circle, connecting with the possibility of giving and receiving light and insight tonight. So um, I met Sonia through uh, writing workshops that I taught in Los Gatos. And I'm honored that Martha is also part of that group. And um, I learned that she's writing a story about the role, the story of cloth in poetry form, about the role that cloth has played in our lives. As I've edited and looked at that book in process, I learned a lot about what the artisans and her native land suffered. Um, and um, and, and I understood better the, the interwoving weaving of cloth as a symbol for our connectedness. Sonia's poetry, which I hope she'll read tonight also, is um, really, really beautiful. She recently addressed the World Parliament of Religions, uh, giving uh, with a summary of her beginnings, and yesterday spoke at a human, um, not homeless, seeking shelter, art and poetry event that many of us, some of us helped co-create at the Citadel Gallery in San Jose. So without further ado, I welcome Sonia Sharma and her husband, Sharad. Thank you. Thank you. And let us breathe that all in and open our arms to welcome. Open our arms to welcome. Yes. Thank you, Sonia. Would you like me to start? Would you yes. Like music? Make sure I can hear you. <laughs> can, can everyone hear Ms. Sonia? Okay, can I start? Hello, hello everybody. Good evening. My name is Sonia and I've been graciously invited by Lynn 
and Janet and everyone at UCM to share my stories. But in the war and weft of my stories are your stories. Our realities are interwoven. There's a divine golden thread that binds each and every one of us. I'd like to begin the evening by lighting a lamp. It's a part of the tradition. Tonight the moon is full, you said. Yes, tonight the moon is full. Um, so there's, there's an etheric sphere around the flame. It creates receptivity to, to connect with and to receive grace. And um, I thank you for gathering around this make-believe campfire. I've heard that the storytellers of yore, they understood that stories told around a campfire, they stay with us. And uh, because it's the fire that creates uh, greater receptivity. That's probably why we have all the oral narratives that, they do, that we do have, uh, that they didn't dissipate into ether. Yes, today is the full moon and it's considered the most auspicious full moon of the year. It's the day to honor our spiritual masters, the universal masters, spiritual guides, spiritual elders, and, uh, and actually our parents as well, because they are the first gurus, the first teachers. Uh, we actually sit with ourselves and contemplate, do a flashback, go back a whole year, month by month, through events and happenings and situations, we recollect and then we, um, we see our growth. And that's the way we measure our growth as a seeker. And, uh, and then we feel the fullness that no matter how it looked, we feel grateful because we see that it was all about growth. And then you feel, we feel as luminous as the full moon tonight. Beautiful. And whenever you want me to sing, just let me know, Sharma. Oh. Let me know, Miss Sonia. Oh, please, absolutely. So you are, let are me you know. Wanting, uh, Sonia, are you wanting to lead us back through those months? Oh, oh you, would you like to do, um, I can do an invocation, Lynn. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. We, uh, we invoke, can we invoke um, Archangel Michael, Archangel Raphael, Archangel Gabriel to be with us, spiritual elders, spiritual masters, the light, the universe that guides us with love and light, that surrounds us with love and light, that protects us with love and light, that imbues us with love and light. Uh -huh. I have been glancing back at time, looking for myself, scanning with my mind's eye, anecdotes, incidents, those little moments to write about and describe all that has made me who I am. I traversed my gallery, looking for shadow and light and smiled when I understood it is in the shadows that my gifts are held. I was born in Bombay, in India. Can, can we all hear her? Are we able to hear Sonia? I can, can you? Okay, Annie, Annie was having a little difficulty. So, okay. so it, to come as close as you can to hear this wonderful information, please. Yes. Okay. Well, so. I was hearing her, but then then something happened, and it's. Oh, I see. Yeah. 
All right. Okay. Okay. So I was saying that I was born in Bombay, in India, and brought up in a Hindu family where the traditions revolve around cultural celebration. Um, festivals. Festivals are like effervescent bubbles and confetti uh, in India. They, they shift the day-to-day the -day mundane, banal rhythm of life. Energy and enthusiasm permeate the home, the markets, the bazaars, uh, the places of worship, and they always correlate with the season, with the time of year, with the movement of the sun into uh, one of the hemispheres, the northern or the southern hemisphere, with the, with the waxing and the growing of the moon, with harvest time. And so food and sweets are a focal point um, of festivals and uh, sweets are made as offerings to the divine. Uh, the practice is that whatever the divine gives us, we offer in childlike play, we offer it back to the divine and that is called a puja. Uh, I'll show you. I'd like to show you a puja offering. So it's a platter. It will usually have a coconut, flowers, a candle, and a symbolic deity. And when the candle is lit, we wave it around as if to say, ward off the darkness of ignorance and invoke light. The coconut often um, uh, symbolizes uh, the ego. It's so hard, the coconut. It's hard to break the coconut. And so when you offer and when you actually break the coconut on the ground, it takes many tries before it cracks open. And this, this is our, it's hard to offer our ego, our arrogance. And so that's, uh, that's the symbol that that carries. Um, so we offer everything back to the divine and, and it's always about gathering. It will never be just the family. It will be the, um, uh, you know, it will be uh, extended family, friends, neighbors, even strangers uh, who, who come together, who exchange. It doesn't matter if they don't know each other very well, but at such times, Everybody transcends, and this creates belongingness. Uh, in every Indian home, there's always an altar. It could be um, a corner in the kitchen. It could be in, the, in, in a room. It could be an entire room or just, just a shelf somewhere. And um, it, um, it will have, have just like this uh, platter that I showed you. It will have incense sticks, a uh, candle, and uh, sacred ash, sandalwood, vermilion powder, and whatever suits anybody's desire or fantasy. Um, and the purpose of this altar is to remind us that there is a higher purpose. It's not just about material needs. It's not just about um, swirling around in, uh, you know, in, in clothes and food and shelter and job and, uh, and, and those that there is always a, a, a higher need. And also it gives us a place to, to bow down, you know, in surrender, in thanks, in angst, whatever one is feeling, there's, there's a place where you can bow down. And that's, that's the altar. There are uncountable gods and goddesses and gurus. And uh, because everybody needs an entity with, with which they can relate, have no inhibitions and just be themselves completely. Um, there are chants and prayers and most prayers are, are invocations for our auspiciousness, for the removal of obstacles. You know, like we say, let's clear and transmute all energy blocks through time, dimension, space, and reality. Symbols abound, there are, everything is symbolic. 
you know, the candle is symbol of light and the, and the Ganesha is the symbol of auspiciousness. So, um, and of course, then there's, there's karma and there's dharma. They are like the two banks. We are like the river that flow between the black banks of karma and dharma. They, they constantly remind us there's cause and effect and there's responsibilities. And this, whether you're highly educated and qualified or you're completely unlettered and illiterate, this is the most pervasive. So you see, it's just, it's, it's a way of life. It's not really an, a religion at all. Um, it's not an ism. So we, we don't really get caught in the ism, in the theosophy of it. Um, and the, these, these are the tenets of, um, of, of being Hindu. So um, about 25 years ago, we lived in Bangalore, uh, Sharad, my husband, and our two children and I, we lived um, uh, in Bangalore. And on a grocery run to, to the market one day, I spotted an old lady with a cane basket filled with um, dry um, lotus pods and um, pine -like balls, kind of like, kind of like this and foraged dried leaves, all neatly um, uh, uh, wired on, on sticks. And I instantly purchased most of her, whatever, whatever her basket held and brought them home and arranged them in a vase. The same week, um, a neighbor took me to a potter's settlement in a nearby suburb. And I purchased several pots and uh, came home and made Ikebana style flower arrangements mixed with fresh and silk flowers. It was like writing poetry, haiku and sonnets in a craft form. I started to visit the street vendors and potters every day. Pottery or pot making is an ancient craft inherited as a profession from the forefathers, according to the traditional caste system in India. The most ubiquitous turning on the potter's wheel is perhaps that of a water pot, uh, a simple vessel of everyday use, uh, which is used in every Indian kitchen, every Indian household has one. Um, and of course, an earthen pot is, is vulnerable in that it cracks and breaks and uh, returns to earth. Uh, and so the potters are kept painfully engaged creating pots. Not only does the pot sustain life by holding water and keeping it naturally cool in scorching Indian summers, it is a highly symbolic container. It holds ashes after the soul has crossed over and the body has returned to dust. The potters toil at their craft and kill, only to earn a meager income. They are poor, unlettered, and uneducated, but so cognizant of the unwritten laws of dharma. They work hard in the searing sun. They live in tightly knit communities. And for the most part, they try to stay in their profession. Friends, neighbors, and their friends liked my arrangements and started to stop by our home to buy them at trunk shows and exhibitions. This gave impetus to the potters as well as the dry flower sellers. Together, we had created a platform to showcase their work and for them to earn. I had unfolded into my purpose collaborating with street artisans, small uh, scale cottage industry workers became my ordained gemstone of a purpose. Then while it was in flow, my husband thought of exploring a tech job offer here in Sunnyvale in California. 
It felt right for the family, for the children, and for the highest good of all. When adventure comes knocking, it feels wise to explore. My purpose suddenly felt truncated. But I couldn't sabotage an opportunity that was for the good of the family. I did, I did resist the move. I cringed at leaving my new family members, my potters and the dry flower growers. They would be adrift. And how could they stay afloat? It wasn't just about the earnings. There was a bond, there was a human bond. As I resented our decision, I felt a churn in the crevice of my belly. I sat in my emptiness and I grieved. I grieved the loss of my purpose and my people. So how did I stay grounded? when the ground was moving. I started to realize that all resistance is pain. What I resist will persist. And when we hit a wall, the first thing that leaves is faith. I held on to faith. I relinquished and realized that whatever I left behind was the preface on my journey toward greater unfolding. I stood, I stood still and looked at the lilies in the field. Slowly, but steadily, I started to find my way. I started receiving spiritual awakening. The first one came in the form of a breath meditation, a rhythmic breathing practice that releases stored and buried emotions from deeper levels. I learned how the breath is that golden gate bridge that connects mind with body. Steadily, I received more and more spiritual guidance. Silence retreats, intuitive experiences through Yogananda's Self-Realization Fellowship, um, the awakening of Kundalini Shakti. I learned the wisdom behind ritual and scripture. And all these led to the most endearing experience of all, and that is serving and supporting large congregations of devotees in prayer and worship at the Sai Baba Temple in Sunnyvale and Milpitas. Once again, I had unfolded into my purpose. And this is my story of how I was, so to say, the Renaissance, the rebirth, how I came to a faraway land to receive the most precious initiation and to grow beyond imagination. I thank you.
for this sacred sharing. Were it not for this, my story may have re remained unuttered and stayed within the archives of my mind and our memories. Thank you. We, uh, Sonia was encouraging me to ask questions and to invite questions from you about Hinduism as a cultural celebration where she grew up and the difference in um, her path of self-realization, which as you say things, it sounds as if you could have been in the universal church of the master for the last 30 or 40 years because the language is so similar. Yes. It, it, and it seemed to me that your the Hinduism took a more universal form when you came here. And um, I remember Father Matthew Fox of uh, the very liberated Catholic theologian said there are exoteric religions mm -hmm. which are crystallized and find themselves to be very different from others. Mm -hmm. And then there's the esoteric heart of spiritual faith, which unites us into a sense of oneness and the paths come together. Mm -hmm. In graduate school, when we studied Hinduism as a world religion, I like the idea that Hinduism recognized many paths to the top of the mountain of understanding. And that's been true in our church as well. When you grew up versus your experiences in self-realization, did you find that you moved from the exoteric outer sense of your faith to the inner esoteric, or how would you describe it? Um, you know, before this talk, Sharad and I had a chat and we went back to our childhood and asked each other, how was it growing up? And we realized that even our parents didn't really impose the religious aspect of, of being Hindu. It was always just a way of living. You know, we, we worship food and we call her the divine Annapurna. So, so we, we will thank food when it appears before us that it will nurture us, every part of our being, every drop of blood, every cell, every nerve, every organ, every bone, every muscle, every tissue, every chromosome, every mitochondria, you know. Um, so we receive the food in that way. Oh, this is God. So same, same with a book, you know. Um, a book is knowledge. And so a book represents the goddess of learning, Saraswati. And uh, the book contains information, which when read well becomes knowledge. And when, um, you know, when you're really able to extract the essence of it, it becomes wisdom. And there is nothing higher than wisdom, uh, you know, the untouched uh, intellect within us. Um, so, so this is how it is that animate and inanimate, everything has an aura, everything has energy and everything can be worshiped. You put a little vermilion and a flower and a little bit of sandalwood on a rock and a stone, and you will find passers-by stopping by to, uh, to bow down, to fold hands, as, as if it has been energized. So, um, so, so that's the kind of practice it is. Did you have... Um... So did you have as as we might have Passover or Christmas or um, you know certain festivals, whether whether everyone is going to a church or a temple or not, did you find that to be true in your social circle? Yes, yes, absolutely. Oh yes, yes. Those, those are big occasions. There's Diwali, which is the festival of lights, which comes um, around fall, and uh, it's all about. Uh, candles as we have just lit um, to dispel the darkness. And, and you know, we have two major epics, just like Homer's Odyssey and Iliad, uh, which form the in infrastructure of, uh, of, of the Western world. We have the Mahabharat and the Ramayana. And so numerous stories uh, form a great uh, inter interconnected web of, of the big epics. And, um, uh, and, and so we, we draw upon these, the characters, the symbols, the significance, 
and um, and and these kind of guide the way you know you read them to to children as bedtime stories um and uh, we also also go to you know street theater to see the performances of of these at at certain times of the year and particularly for the for the unlettered this um this is their this this is their guidance this is it, where it, it, it sounds something like in christianity the christmas story or in judaism the the, the oral story at, at passover at hanukkah and i'm also was struck by the wonderful goddesses to balance the gods in in the panoply of hinduism which sometimes isn't true in other traditions when i grew up and went to menlo park presbyterian church i saw no feminine images i did when i stepped into a friend's catholic church and i do through hinduism we also studied that there's the bhakti personal devotion path and also the janana more abstract path yes but it's it sounds like what you're describing to us is very bhakti so it is absolutely absolutely and the gyan which is knowledge or wisdom that comes through experience or through the epic and that i think that's a personal unfolding when you're ready to receive uh, the wisdom to move to shift your consciousness deepens when you shed off layers of conditioning and programming that have gone with you through your life maybe through many lifetimes and what you've acquired from through genetics and parents and the environment right absolutely and bhakti is 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 the fun and frolic path yes and interesting what you said about the about the feminine deities there there they are as uh, as many as there are male deities and in fact we always say it's the woman first so it's sita ram oh and it's it's uh, radhe sham so krishna and radha it's always radha and krishna so interesting yes interesting and that that was appealing along with the wonderful artwork and, and the the scents and the fruit and the patterns of devotion in the ancient um goddess tradition which um researched during that graduate time i learned from barbara walker's work that all of the different goddesses are part of the one and in a sense that was true in egypt too and would you say that the gods and goddesses are part of the one absolutely absolutely you know we need we need variety we need diversity i mean imagine if you could only eat zucchini all year round <laughs> or, or you just have roses and uh, no no lilies and you know no daisies so it's just like that so in fact the 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 pantheon is is humongous there are 33 million gods and goddesses there really no doubt that's <laughs> incredible are you sure 33 million so oh you my god it goes back to we are, we are now in the kali yuga you know the kali yuga so yuga is a measurement of time so like that there have been various uh slots of time and so when it started in in the sat yuga when every soul was a pure untarnished soul and had not gathered so much so many layers at that time the world population was 33 million and everyone was every soul was a god and goddess and so it stuck that we mm. have as many and you're you're totally at liberty to create as many as you like oh yes yes and yeah, so i didn't a tree becomes you know a pl your place of worship or your uh, where you bow down and so does a rock and and so on well the the sense of um seeing the creator in nature yes. that is something that um so, some religions have lost fox called it dualism when this world is negative and we must only look at heaven or a perfect world we fail to see the beauty and the sacredness of nature and it sounds like the certainly in regard for the respect for animals and as well as the plant life that that is a kind of an ecological sacred nature system would you say yes yes well said absolutely this is how we have always incorporated environment and uh, and there was no degradation at that time uh, 
could you kind of take us through your wheel of the year, starting with this holiday and tell us what it's about, what we could do, and maybe some of the others that go along in the wheel, of the, the, the celebrations and holidays? Oh, all right. Okay, okay. So um, um, you, you said something about dualism from Matthew Fox and the absolute drop of ambrosia from the Vedas which is really where it comes from. You know, it's uh, um, Hindu also comes from. Hindu is actually a person who lives between the land of the Himalayas and the Indian Ocean. Himalayas to the extreme north and the Indian Ocean to the extreme south. Everybody who lives on that land was a Hindu. So um, the, the Vedas, which is where we get our uh, most ancient knowledge from, is all about um, non-duality. So as soon as you light a lamp, the darkness is gone. So there's, there's no duality. And that's really our striving is to achieve that. And when you reach there, then you have total clarity. And when you have clarity, then, then there are no issues. So, um, the holiday we find ourselves in is around July 4th. Is that what you're saying? Uh, it, it comes in July. In and, July. Yes. And so unlike in America, we uh, don't follow the calendar. We follow what is called the nakshatra, which means the movement of the stars and the moon. And, and that decides. And those movements decide, those constellations, they decide the, the date and time of the festival for, for each year. So I know there's a system of astrology um, that uses houses, particularly. It's a little bit different from the Placidian system in the West. I see. And, um, and so each, the, the astrologers, are, they calculate the, the date each year. In general, what does this festival mean for us? Oh, uh, so today is called Guru Purnima. Purnima means the full moon. So, you know, every month there is a big moon, it's a different one, it has different significance, again, depending on the season, which month it comes in. And so uh, you feel the fullness of the moon. We've all heard of la lune, the French word for the moon is, the, is la lune, and you, you know how the mind, so the mind represents the moon. And you will notice as a seeker, as a meditator, you will notice um, your thought patterns and how, um, how they get impacted by the moon. Um, so this is a way of inviting the cosmos into our day-to-day -day lives. Here on earth, we can just get totally entangled in ourselves and our lives and, um, and may or may not notice the moon on a walk, uh, may or may not notice the angle of the sun as it changes and how it you know, beats into the room and so on. Uh, and so that's why festivals are created to, uh, to bring, to connect with, with the cosmos. I, I've noticed that the festivals of different traditions fall at similar times. Uh -huh. And so, um, but I was thinking about, you know, countries that are above or below the equator might uh, respond to different natural conditions, warmth or cold. What are there East Indian traditions starting say around what we would have as either Celtic Yule, Christmas, Hanukkah uh, in that period of December, later December, are, is there a holiday? Um, is there like, um, you know, we're so busy with Christmas in India. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't really, uh, Christmas and New Year is big time celebration. And once again, you're not following the solstice or the equinox, you're following certain planetary and moon, moon positions. And of course, solstice and equinox, of course. There's such an when, when you grew up, um, so did you integrate some traditions since you had British education? Did you also do Christmas? And totally. I, I think I knew more Christmas carols than I knew uh, Sanskrit chants. When I was I yes. What, what are some of the languages that you speak? Oh. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> or understand a little bit of. Yeah, so a little smattering because, you know, having lived uh, in different parts of the country and that, uh, and that uh, living in different parts of the country has certainly added to uh, 
uh, to my opening, to my receptivity of our own culture, because it can be so distinct from, uh, you know, varied from the geographic uh, location that you're in. Some parts of the country, such as the southern parts, they are much more, uh, uh, much more steeped in the religious aspects. Uh, they're well, much more grounded. They tend to do uh, more, perform more rituals. Um, and so you were asking about the, the festivals. So now this is like pretty much bang in the middle of the year. The, you know, today's day, it's, it's a day or two here and there. So these days, and also the days leading up to it, because it's not possible to do it all on that one day. So the days leading up to it, you know, is, is, is the anticipation of festivity and how you're going to do it. Um, and July, August, so there's, there's harvest time, there's, uh, you know, there's time to, uh, to sow the seeds around January time, and there's time to, uh, to harvest certain crops, and then later in the year again. So, you know, it used to be largely an agrarian agricultural economy, and that's why a lot of festivals are connected with, um, with agriculture, and, uh, uh, you know, just as a little a side note on that, that's the reason cotton created, you know, cotton cloth uh, shifted the world balance in terms of um, uh, world economy, you know, from, from, from east to west, it tilted and has stayed that way. So um, um, it became a crash crop when India got colonized. It used to be a subsistence crop. Everybody just worked together and harvested the, the, the crops they would eat and the crops that they would spin and weave. And then when the colonizers came, then they realized that this, they, they love cotton. They'd never seen cotton before. They'd only known linen and wool in, in Britain and Scotland and the British Isles. Um, and so, um, so cotton became um, a cash crop. Um, so that's about the agricultural uh, aspect which also, uh, which also flavors and colors, uh, you know, uh, um, festivals, celebrations. Um, um, perhaps now that we are all, uh, we, you know, we're all cosmopolitan, metropolitan folks, perhaps we don't think of it so deeply that uh, what, what is the origin? Where is it coming from? Where is the celebration coming from? So August, uh, in August we have, um, a festival which is for brothers and sisters. That's another thing, you know, that they honor each relationship. So in August, it's the time for sisters to tie a uh, kind of a thread. So a thread is considered as an, uh, it, it is the ageless talisman, I call it, because it absorbs uh, energy and it becomes a bond. So a sister ties a uh, the, the thread, the, the consecrated sacred thread on her brother. And this symbolizes that he will, she is grateful for his protection and his love. And, uh, you know, he then gives, gives her a gift. Uh, and so this, um, this solidifies the bond between brother and sister. Uh, oh, and, uh, and then in September, we have, uh, we have the nine nights of Mother Divine because we have the autumnal equinox at that time. Uh, so nine nights uh, uh, symbolize the nine months that we spend in the mother's womb. And so it's a time to, uh, to go within, to, um, uh, to do some, um, you know, to lean in, in into yourself, um, self-examination, uh, you know, self-realization and uh, you change your diet, you, you eat very light, uh, you give up certain foods. So kind of a fast just to, you know, actually cleanse uh, the, the system, maybe kind of like, kind of like a detox. Uh, and uh, after, after light eating and quiet days, then in the evening there's celebration. So you, you know, get together with everyone. So gathering. You see how there was no loneliness, there was no mental disease back then, because it was always about what the Buddha called the Sangha. You know, what is that? The Sangha is, is the gathering, it is seeking truth together. The how, do you, how do you spell that, Sonia? So Sangha is S-A-N-G-A. It's one of the tenets of uh, Buddhism. 
and uh, and we call it the satsang you know seeking truth together in togetherness we seek because when you're alone how do you ever come to know who you are even when we are asked to uh, in in meditation when we are asked to close our eyes and and contemplate who am i so and you keep saying this who am i who am i who am i um, how can you know yourself in um, in isolation is that did you say at the fifth end of the fifth day in the nine day nights of mother divine that that's a special day or is it on the ninth day it's the ninth day it's the ninth day, day. so it's moving it. moving from september what happens next in the year uh, may i just say something because it's please. so profound if i may just interrupt for a moment please. sonia it talks about and it's resonating with me about how after the vta shooting our center has done a lot of response for the VTA folks and, and for the responders. And it's all about coming together to find healing and truth and comfort. And it's exactly what you're talking about. And I'm also struck in the Jewish tradition, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, it's all about that inner guidance, that inner you know, exploration that you do you know, as you're being born the ninth month, again, the nine days, you know, representing the nine mm -hmm. months. And I'm just wanting to acknowledge the parallels yes. and the richness because Hinduism is one of our most ancient traditions, oh, spiritual is. traditions. And so thank you. I just wanted to take a moment and just revel in this amazing, you know, information that, that you and Lynn are both guiding us through. So mm -hmm. thank you. Well Thank you, Janet. And after we go through the wheel, we'll, maybe we'll get a chance to listen to your song. Any, as you move along through the wheel of the seasons, does anything else stand out to you, Sonia? Um, well, I just wanted to acknowledge Janet coming in and saying that that's the purpose of congregation, to, to learn from each other and, uh, and to be still and know that the universe is with us. Uh, and all ancient people knew this, and they didn't they didn't segregate so much the way we do now, you know? They didn't have the isms and the ologies, right? The Hinduism, the Buddhism, the Sikhism, the Jainism, you know, they, they, they didn't have those. They had practices and they were so similar, which means that human consciousness, where it was and how it has fallen and how it needs to be resurrected is what we are really gleaning through our... Um, discussion you know it's it's it sounds like you're taking us to the esoteric universal hinduism the universal that that at heart is parallel to other traditions so um let's see we were we were in september what's the next major holiday is it fall or january you said yeah so uh, so yeah so on the ninth day they we do the they, they do the dance it's called the dance of perfect attunement with, with mm. sticks, men and women get together and you know it's a, it's a rhythmic dance very beautiful very colorful um, and um, and each day is signified by a separate uh, feminine um, energy so um, so we uh, awaken within ourselves you know the powers to um, the powers to, to be still the power to face, the power to overcome, uh, the power to discriminate, the power to discern. And after those nine days, you feel cleansed and ready to go back into the, the circus of life. The circus of life. You mentioned that in January, there's the planting of seeds in January. Yes, so I'll just backtrack a little bit and go to October. October is Diwali. Oh, I, October is Diwali. Diwali is the festival of light. How do, you spell, how do you spell that, Sonia? So D-I-W-A-L-I. -I. Oh, festival of lights, okay. Yeah. Yes, and so in essence, we light lamps, a series of lamps, and that's what it means, and exchange sweet, and uh, come back to the epic of the Ramayana, um, and um, 
Um, and it's, it's a large scale celebration all over the country. And again, it's about gathering, exchanging sweets. So sweet is a big thing because it symbolizes getting away from embittered relationships, tangles and knots that we get caught up in throughout the year. And so now we covered with sweet. So sweet, sweet speech, uh, a sweet smile, uh, a sweet attitude, a sweet perspective, and sweet interrelations. It's interesting when you brought those sweet treats in our morning class, but they were very natural. They were like dates, you know, they were they were made of fruits. Thank you. And then um, and then the next holiday would be January. So yeah, so Diwali is October, November the time frame. And uh, you know, there are always small little ones that, that one misses in between. There's never a month without. And and of course, then there's Eid, which you know, which is also a holiday for everyone. Banks will be closed and schools will be closed. Um, and so there, there's celebration. It may not be, you know, in, in, in the Hindu home, but you have neighbors and friends. Uh, and then there are, uh, uh, there are other holidays of other communities. So, uh, so, so there's always something is always on. Well, it gives us a flavor. Thank you. And um, maybe Janet, did you want to, to share the song that, that Sonia requested? And Janet always... Um attunes to her song in the moment. So this is a song that has probably never been sung before and or heard before. <laughs> Absolutely. And if that, if that feels right, we'll do that. We'll just see what comes out, right? We'll just see what comes out. And so I just invite you all to relax, you know, into the words that our beautiful Sonia has shared with us to take in the spiritual energy of the light and know that you are a very beautiful part of that light. Through the darkness I see the light through trials I find the light and all that brings me here that opens up my heart and all that I can be opens up to the pathway of my life
that, that kind, of, kind of spontaneous creativity is something that Sonia expresses as Janet just expressed wonderfully through the song that she really let come through her. Sonia expresses through poetry. Do you have a couple of poetries about cloth or anything else you could share with us, Sonia, or the one you read yesterday? <laughs> Love to hear it. Oh, would you like to hear that one again? Yes. 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 And, yes. <laughs> what a the home, human, not homeless gathering. Yes. What a beautiful evening in the light. What a beautiful evening in the light. Thank you. Thank you for being here, John. Okay. We hold John and Rose in um, healing energy as they have had that uh, ailment um, pass, passing through them. Blessed be. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. And, you know, everyone take and dip your ladle into the wonderful pool of light that is here that Sonia and Lynn have created and yes. we all have created by our presence here. Yes. You know, let, let that fill you up, my friends. And we would love to hear some poetry, Miss Sonia. Yes. Yes, we would. So Lynn, perhaps you can do something. Give me a minute to get up and grab that. <laughs> Wonderful. So we we were at um yeah, we experienced a gathering that was dedicated to the concept of of human not homeless um, seeking shelter. And it was one in which um, an exhibit that had been at the Martin Luther King Library also large portraits of individual people who are without house. And as we looked into their eyes and connected with our common experiences, it was really beautiful. And then artists and poets um, invoked the rest of the path. I'm sure that if you have any questions of Sonia when, as she returns, that she would be happy to share. I was struck in reading her story of cloth that when the colonists wanted the profits of the um, of cloth in their country that they sometimes even injured the weavers so they couldn't weave. And now through her her book that she's writing that honors these weavers and, and connects again to the origins of the cotton, the cloth that we wear worldwide that came from from her culture. Um, If anyone, you might have questions that are arising to you related to um, things that she's shared. I just got the impression, and also, Sherrod, are you there? Yes, Lynn, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Could you come and share with us for just a moment as you did before? Because um, I'd like to hear from you too and see you. Yeah, yeah, you know, we were, I, I tried to log in from a different computer, but then it makes uh, echo sound, so I didn't want to disturb this. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you come close to your lovely wife, we can hear from you. Um, is there something that occurred to you, Sharad, that, um, that parallels what Sonia is saying, or is there anything that might help us just understand your, your experience a little better. All of you together have created such a wonderful uh, atmosphere. So um, I don't really want to kind of uh, say anything beyond, but um, uh, I think Sonia, Sonia and all of you covered it pretty, pretty well. And um, uh, uh, just that, you know, kind of over time, as you know, in every country, the politics kind of takes over and uh, you'll also hear news coming from India, which is not always very positive, which is, which is, which is rather unfortunate, but uh, that's how kind of life is, uh, where people are, instead of uh, integrating and coming together, are going different directions. So all what you talk today, I think is, is becoming more and more uh, critical for people to you know, get to this path and understand that uh, higher purpose, so to say. Uh, but uh, you know, when we look at, uh, um, so we have a lot to be proud of um, uh, coming from where we come, but, you know, things are changing and uh, unfortunately not for, not for uh, better, you know, which is, which is unfortunate uh, things are, you know, so. The world Absolutely. as a whole seems to, seems to be going through a period of testing yes. the world yes. as a whole. But yes. the, the broader reincarnational perspective and the karmic and grace perspective that it that is so uh, commonly known in India has certainly helped some of us <laughs> on the on our path 
through this church as well, even those that may have a mystical Christian or a Jewish base, they, the thought that we may live more than once and that these are karmic experiences leading us to grace has been important. Are you ready to, thank you very much, Sherrod. Are you ready to share a poem with us? Uh, yes, if you'd like to uh, hear this one that I read the other day. At yes. The Festival, which was such a spirited, high energy, rich and meaningful experience. Oh, we were amazed. First of all, the historic site with the very, very high ceilings <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, all the artist studios to have chosen to come there. And, uh, and the people who put so much into it, they've started a conversation, which is they're so vital and so critical, and it needs to be carried everywhere. It, yeah. Um, so, uh, so we had a theme. Uh, that weekend. And uh, here's what came out um, connecting to that um, homeless. Can, can we all hear her? Yes, hopefully yes. so. Okay, go ahead. Okay. I remember. I remember my visit to Mother Teresa's orphanage long years ago. It was on the other side of Delhi far away from where we lived. I remember the little girls all standing in a crib, holding on to the side. I remember feeding each one kitchen, a soft mix of <laughs> lentils, turn by turn, out of a stainless steel bowl and a single spoon. I remember their eyes talking to me. I remember their tiny fingers touching my hand. I remember their excited voices calling me Didi, Didi, which means big sister. I remember how starved they were for attention more than food, for love more than anything. I remember the sari clad nuns attending to everyone in selfless service. I remember how clean, combed, and amazingly quiet the little girls were. But I cannot forget how intuitive a tiny being can be. She holds her needs, her pain, within her little bosom. I cannot forget how, knowing that no one will respond to her cries, the little one stayed quiet, eerily and sadly quiet. Not belonging to someone is being hopeless. And let's just breathe that in for a moment. That was an incredible. And in, in the tradition of, of poetry reading, could we hear it one more time? <laughs> because as the, the lines sink in, and then maybe we can even comment on the line that has struck us, okay. the line that has touched our heart. I think I think each, each line of that touched my heart. It, it's almost too hard to hear, you know, what they went through, but good to think that they were in Mother Teresa's care at that yeah. point. Did you want to read it again for Janet? Okay. Certainly. Okay. Feel free to stop me wherever, um, wherever you feel touched. And we can then move on. Yeah. I remember... I remember my visit to Mother Teresa's orphanage long years ago. It was on the other side of Delhi, far away from where we lived. I remember the little girls all standing in a crib, holding on to the side. I remember feeding each one khichri, a soft mix of rice and lentils, turn by turn out of a stainless steel bowl 
at a single spoon. I remember their eyes talking to me. I remember their tiny fingers touching my hands. I remember their excited voices calling me Didi, Didi, which means big sister. I remember how starved they were for attention more than food, for love more than anything. I remember the sari clad nuns attending to everyone in selfless service. I remember how clean, cold, and amazingly quiet the little girls were. But I cannot forget how intuitive a little being can be. She holds her needs, her pain, within her little bosom. I cannot forget <clears throat> knowing that no one will respond to their cries. The little ones stayed quiet, eerily and sadly quiet not belonging to someone is being homeless. Not belonging to someone is being homeless. It's so profound. <clears throat> I, the story makes me want to tell a parallel story with a happy ending. Mm. And that was that about Mother Teresa and a man named, a monk named Brother Roger who it originated Teze in uh, the World War II period when countries were torn. He created the, the musical, he was a Protestant brother. I didn't know there were such things. And he created the musical ritual of Teze that some of us have come to know and love. He visited Mother Teresa and there, I have a picture of them, Mother Teresa and Brother Rogers with a little child bee between them when he was there, a little girl was found a baby on the street and she was, they thought she had about an hour to live. But brother Roger took her with him and held her for six months at almost every moment. And um, she went on to be a doctor who came back and helped mother Teresa. To me, that is the most beautiful story that really illustrates how religions and spiritual traditions have a oneness when they reach out in compassion and action to others. Wow. And that is incredible. And it also reminds us of the full circle of giving and receiving. You know, she was received and given a chance and then she in turn gave. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful reminder. What a beautiful reminder. Perhaps you have Thank you. Some questions and comments for Sonia now. Sonia, I do. This is Laurel. I, I'm very saddened because I always picture Mother Teresa doing the right thing. Uh -huh. And the way you describe this is that there was much lacking there. <laughs> I mean, you have that, you have, you say without hope. Uh, you know, we heard Lynn describe when I know Brother Rogers, I was at Taze, so I'm very familiar with that. Okay. And um, I, I just am concerned for that. Um, I was very saddened. Um, I know of people in Romania for years now, since the 1990 or so, established um, houses of hope for the children there mm -hmm. who were abandoned in cribs, but I mean, truly abandoned. Yeah. And they had, uh, with AIDS and so on, and were, have been cared for all these years. Uh -huh. uh, I just wonder about that, Sonia. Um, so, so, Laura, there's, there's a sad undertone to this little narrative, which, uh, which just is, is raw. It's unedited. It just came out like this. Um, I'm recollecting a memory from maybe 40 years ago. Sure. Um, and... It, it, it just got recorded in the archives. Now, did you hear how 
um, how well taken care of they were. They were clean and combed and fed, and they were waiting, waiting to be adopted. So instead of being just relegated on the, to the streets or just, just left, uh, you know, they were brought into a home, they were cared for, and now folks will come and adopt them. Okay, so they're getting spruced up. Y yes, yes, they are there in a home and they will, so they're, they're in waiting, you know, they're, they're in transit. So some souls stay in transit for a while, you know, until, until yeah. they find the right home. It's just human nature that how even uh, a, a little baby knows, uh, you know, like spoiled brats, how they will cry and throw tantrums because they know that parents are going to, going to react. Uh, more than respond, uh, sure. and they do all this. They do all this to catch our attention, right? They have something. They were they have one toy. They want another and a third, and all. But the child who who doesn't have much, and and you know the the nuns are working constantly. They're working nonstop. They are doing God's work, but they cannot take each one and and play with them. So um, so I I look at it as if they're just in transit waiting. For a good home, and eventually they all feel hope so. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you for coming, Laurel, from our writing group, also. Yes. And uh, Laurel has written uh, through her church um, some workbooks on um, calling up memory and has experiences with grief traditions. And I always, uh, I like to brag on your age, but I shouldn't <laughs> expose your age, but I'm always so excited about it. <laughs> We're inspired, absolutely inspired. <laughs> and you know, it's amazing, my friends, as we sit and listen and have this conversation with each other, how powerful uh, the, the similarities of our life streams, our threads of our lives, how when they are woven into a cloth, uh, we can see all different perspectives of it. And, and hold all different hopes, Laurel, as you said so beautifully. It's like being touched by the sadness of it oh. and then holding the hope, you know, both at the same time. I'm always there. That's, that's always truly, there. truly honoring, you know, truly honoring the, so, the wholeness of it. So thank Sammy, you. Do you, have, do you have any more poems handy on uh, anything that you'd like to share with us? Because part of your, your mission is your poetry. <clears throat> and others may have thoughts as well. Um, I find something to share. Something to share. I, I did write yesterday, um, read at the homeless show something about Mother Teresa, which I'll share a poem as Sonia is looking for her um, next poem. It's called Unsheltered in San Francisco. I feel good knowing that these days, Mother Teresa's Sisters of Charity bring persons sleeping on cold concrete under this city's bridges, together with volunteers from cozy houses offering piping hot plates of steaming staples delivered daily in answer to these sisters' prayers. Raised Protestant, I rebelled against the arid, social climbing Menlo Park Pres Church and fled to old time Catholic atmospheres, usually late of a night by myself, touching prayer worn, worn hands on holographic, kind faced statues, wondering at the unashamed outpouring of simple statements. Pray for us now and at the hour of our death, at the trust, glowing candles and images of saints who meant much to me. Some were women. I was one. I was part of this. And St. Teresa of Calcutta reassured me that elders or infants left to die on the street would be lifted into someone's warm arms. Thank you. Wonderful, Lynn. Thank, Thank you.
Are you ready, Sonia? Um, we want, once went to see the Kanchanjunga, which is one of the highest peaks in the Himalayas. <clears throat> uh, and we went to see the sunrise there. So the first rays of sun, when it hits the earth, comes up there. And uh, you have to be the chosen one to be able to see it. People go there several times and uh, are not always blessed by the sight of the uh, sunrise. So if you would be open, it's good. Please, yes. Sunrise in the Himalayas. It is a precious fleeting moment in time, as gentle as a baby's breath, when the darkness of light, night is turning to dawn. And so it was, as we awaited sunrise at the mystic Kanchanjunga, the highest summit in the mighty Himalayan mountains. Hundreds stood and sat around, bundled in caps, coats, and shawls. Soft invocation chants resonated through the chilly breeze. Faded Buddhist prayer flags fluttered among the trees, anticipating with reverence the grandeur, the majesty, the spectacle of the rising sun as it appeared through the pure fluffy white clouds and constantly dancing mist. Now pink, then orange, even red. Tears streaked down our faces as we beheld in gratitude the golden ball of fire that blesses and illumines our earth in an exuberant dance drama from the abode of divine energy. Mm. Beautiful. 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 So lovely. Mm. I have a feeling you have more that you could share. <laughs> and I'd love for you to We'd love to hear them. And I would just like to take a moment as you're looking for the next poem to just rev revel in that tapestry of Dawn that you created with that incredible poem. That is amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for listening. So we do have a campfire going here. The themes of um, the themes that have to do with being houseless certainly may occur in we we get the sense that there are not quite a lot of people who experience this in in, in India. Would you say that's true um, of being without a house or home, or are we seeing it wrong? That, that there are many without. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh yes. Oh yes. Um, anything, even clothing. True. Food, yes. Yes, there is abject poverty. And, uh, and then I'm also drawn to, uh, you know, how they deal with it. How do they deal with it? So, you know, there are, there are so many different, uh, different ways, but for the most, there's there's a kind of acceptance. You've um, mentioned that, that there's a general attitude of acceptance to lots of things. You wrote about your lovely home, but there were many insects, you know, and, and there wasn't a great deal of fuss, you know, that were just in the air sometimes. And there was a certain acceptance of life's challenges along with life's blessings that might not be known to us as much because of our Western philosophy that doesn't, um, encourage that surrender and you talked earlier about where you can kind of bow a bit that the sense of surrender do you think that having a reincarnational perspective sort of helps people a bigger picture to endure some of the challenges certainly especially the poorer right the illiterate the unlettered that that it's kismat that it's destiny that it's karma 
and uh, if they keep going, it's not that they don't uh, repel or, or it's not that uh, all of them are uh, uh, so accepting, but for the most part, mm -hmm. they're more accepting. I think those who have more, they are less accepting. Mm. I see. Yes. Would you agree with that, Sharad? Well, you know, kind of, there is really no right or wrong answer here. You know, these, these topics are always uh, hard to kind of address because it's really one's perspective. But uh, generally speaking, uh, in India, as you already kind of, um, uh, uh, if you are talking specifically about India, it's again their upbringing of, uh, you know, they are where they are is because of their, their uh, uh, karmic account from the previous birth. So, uh, so there is a level of acceptance and... Uh, uh, I would even go on to say that uh, India, uh, uh, with all the problems it has, uh, because of that belief, uh, it is still uh, staying together because people are not revolting in any other any other culture or any other uh, 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 pe you know people will not tolerate uh, what goes on uh, uh, in certain quarters. So, so it is it is it's a kind of a combination of things that um, uh, you know when the unemployment is high, the journal. Uh, um, because this is this is it's a it's a large country with uh, uh, 1.3 billion people, so it's not really. Okay. It, it depends on which window you open of a room; it gives you a different picture. Uh, that's okay. how I try to kind of give that analogy. There's not, there's never, there's never a single answer which you could say is a is a, is a correct answer because there is uh, there is uh, th there are uh, I see. a different perspective and a different ways of looking at it. But uh, but journal journal uh, it, talking in journal terms, uh, I think it is fair to say that uh, there is a greater level of tolerance uh, in India, mm -hmm. which you don't find in many other uh, countries. Or um, um, uh, therefore, uh, uh, so the level of um, you know uh, uh, the country kind of moves along because of that journal tolerance uh, among mm -hmm. a large number of people. You know. Mm -hmm. I'm amazed that they were able to throw out the British, huh? Because of that, maybe. Yeah, it, it took. It still took a long time, but oh, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, 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 but again, you know, uh, uh, what what the current uh, government is trying to do is bring uh, go back to how it how India was in 1000 AD, you know, thousand or thousand years ago, because oh. uh, in 1200 1200 AD, the the the, the invaders started coming. And uh, so the whole, whole, uh, uh, whole, whole culture and the whole uh, religion, everything kind of started changing. Uh, most of these religions who came to came to India were really uh, uh, naturally came from uh, um, uh, outside of India, and uh, the invasion started coming in 1100. First with the uh, the, the the Mughals, these uh, the 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 Islam, uh, uh, they mm -hmm. came. The invaders, the looters, they would come loot and mm -hmm. go. That went on for uh, almost uh, three to four, five hundred years. Uh, three, yeah, almost three to five hundred years. Uh, and then in the 1600, the East India Company came, so they they took advantage of the kind of a system which was, uh, um, you know, uh, literally thousands of uh, kings and kingdoms, and uh, uh, it was not really kind of united. So uh, India, as you see today. Uh, uh, was also about 2000 years ago, you know, so when you look at the, at the, uh, 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 you know, when, when the sun setting of the, uh, or the new 2000 years ago, uh, uh, the, the, the empire, what we call in our Indian history, uh, the uh, Maurya empire, uh, where, uh, where they had, uh, that whole continent was still one, and it was called uh, um, uh, with the same name or Bharat, you know, which was all the way from the uh, uh, Bay of Bengal to Afghanistan, what you see today, that was all one, one land. Uh, but uh, then over the years, the, the disintegration happened and um, uh, a lot of things kind of came around. Uh, but, uh, that's kind of going into a history lesson. I'll, I'll, I'll get it. Well, no, it's, it, it, it's interesting, Rod, because it but, 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 helps balance our understanding of the... Yeah you know, all the currents. I remember in doing research on the ancient matrifocal goddess traditions worldwide that around that same year or th that 11, 12,000 period, there was an invasion, I think of 
Indo-Aryans and more agrarian, more communal people were sort of overrun by a more patrifocal owning, dominating sort of a philosophy mm -hmm. so that some of the uh, goddess friendly traditions also were impacted. Thank you for sharing that. Did you have a poem I, again? I, I for us? Back, you know, Sonia made a comment that when you look at southern part of India, they're, they're more uh, ritualistic, they're more religion, mm -hmm. because the, 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 mm -hmm. the religion kind of prevailed because the invaders couldn't reach deep south. They would come from the north and, uh, you know, with ah, the battles and yeah. wars, they would, they would be kind of stopped at a particular point. So the southern part of India remained largely um, Hindu nation, so to say. I see. Uh, the invaders couldn't kind of get that deeper into, in, into India. But uh, the parts of uh, the country where we come from, uh, we were always, uh, uh, you know, our ancestors were always fighting the invaders. So be it, uh, 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 you know, Mughals or the, uh, the, 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 those who came from Central America, the, uh, from, from Mongols to Islam to the Britishers. So, uh, um, so that's, that's kind of a part of our, you know, little history. The only thing which uh, 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 we would give kind of, uh, 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 when the Britishers came, they never really touched the religion. They took advantage of it because there were a number of religions, so they would uh, uh, divide and rule type of a policy. Yeah. But uh, uh, they didn't destroy the temples or, or anything like that, um, uh, which, which the, the Islamic rulers didn't do that. They would convert 50,000 Hindus into Muslims every, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So, so what you see a large uh, Muslim population in India, we have about 200 um, uh, million plus people. They yeah. didn't come from anywhere else. They were actually were from that land as, as she explained. Oh, I see, they were there and native. They were supported, you know? So they were all natives. They didn't come from anywhere else. So, so uh, those are kind of all, all how, how it evolved um, uh, that whole continent. But you well, said and that weaves into a fabric that is very powerful. Yeah, a fabric. I mean, the fabric of the threads, you know, of all of those different traditions and how the underpinning of it, you know, remained in that beautiful multicolored fabric, even though invasions and, yeah. you know, changes were happening on yeah. the outside. It's like there was, there's a continuity of spirituality yeah, yeah. and of carrying the light. And I'm thinking of the lamp as you both have so beautifully expressed the lamp has been carried forward. Yes, yes. And I love there's what you such said power in that. That the government now is seeking to go back to exactly. the pre-invaded uh, India. And that's, no, I thought I understood that. Or maybe maybe that was, yeah, but true. It, oh, it is true that they're trying to go back to. Yeah, but that's But you know, you, can't, you cannot erase history a thousand years. You can't say that I'll be, I'll be India of what it was in thousand uh, AD, you know, it's just not possible uh, uh, yeah. because, because uh, uh, India was also, because it took all the religions in, it took all these variations in and what it, what it is, you know. And Sonia and I, we worked in larger cities of India. And uh, um, so like when I, when, when, when I worked in Bombay in my team, I was regional manager for an airline there. In my team, I had a, a, a Hindus, I had Muslims, I had Christians, I had Jews. Uh, so we kind of, we grew up with all religions together. So our respect uh, is much more. So coming to America has been a long time, but uh, 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 22 years now. So for us, it came natural where all religions, uh, 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 you know, kind of survive right. uh, side by side to, to, a, to, a, to a, a good degree, you know, um, I would still claim that. And uh, so, so that's really, uh, so in, in the, just generally people coming from larger cities and uh, they, they, are, they are quite accustomed to uh, all these religions uh, in sync, you know? And um, uh, yeah. so for us, uh, Diwali is as uh, important as Christmas. I mean, that's, at least that's, uh, that's how we look at it, you know? So can, you, can, can we see you just a little bit more, Sharad? Oh, just move toward your wife just a bit. Okay. Yeah, because you're, you're being part of the story. Yeah. So, yeah, you're, I am getting su such a better understanding of India and its traditions now in my second time with the two of you. I, I really understand it. I get some things that I didn't understand before. I right. get the social politics, and that's very important to put it in context. Did yeah. you wish to read another poem, Sonia, or are you? Oh. Thank you, Sharad. Yeah, yeah, I'm welcome. <clears throat> Mm 
Um, I found one small one, and since and since you request, I'll, I'll read this one. Finding me. You will find me in the sweet fragrance of a jasmine flower, in the gold and burnt orange petals of a marigold, in the smoke of a hand rolled incense stick, and in the steady mesmerizing flame of an oil lamp. When my body has merged with the elements and my spirit with the divine light. Beautiful. Mm. When my body mm. has, has merged, merged with, with the, the elements, the elements. Mm -hmm. and my spirit with the divine light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's that incredible, um, you know, again, gathering of the different threads of spirit, body, heart you know, mind light. and blending them into a tapestry of, of light for all of us. Getting back to light. Yes, did, thank you. Did anyone thank have you, Laurel, thank question. you. Do you have a, oh, she was leaving. Yeah, did anyone have leave. any questions or comments or for Sonia or Sherrod or? I would just like to say it's what a beautiful evening and the thoughts and the feelings and the spirit energies and all of the expression was just glowing and it, it made me glow. So I appreciate that. I Beautifully it was, said. Beautifully I, thought it was, said. Uh, I thought it was lovely. Thank you, Sonia. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so grateful for this time together with, with everyone. And Sonia, your heart sings with the love and the light and the wisdom and the spirit that embraces India and the culture and the, the Hinduism. Um, it's like Arjuna with the bow. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you for being here. Our, our church, Universal Church of the Master, has for over a hundred years been open to the joy of the oneness of parallel paths. It started with kind of a, a mystical Christian emphasis and became always open to parallel paths. And now there are so many persons in it who um, <clears throat> who can who enrich us with their paths and their understanding. In October, um, I'm scheduled to speak, but I've invited um, Reverend John Simmons, and we're gonna share spiritual, stories of spiritualism, stories of uh, communication with loved ones and angels coming up. So I don't know, I think if we've reached our formal conclusion, we just need to give these two a hand, Sonia and Sherrod. So. Right. Bravo. I'll turn it over to Janet. <laughs> and you. you know, my friends, let us again, I'm just going to invite us to breathe in what Sonia and Sherrod have given us. Mm -hmm. Let us breathe it in because this will sustain us, my friends, mm -hmm. in, this, in these times that we are in, these challenging times. So just allow yourself to experience their wonderful words and the wonderful experience of tonight washing over every part of your body, every cell of your body, every part of your heart, every emotion of your heart, every dream of wisdom in your mind, and allow your spirit to just take wings and just take wings and fly knowing that what you have as a thread as a part of this tapestry, each and every one of us can give and receive from and with each other. Can we uh, put into this wonderful light any prayers that emerge? Oh. <clears throat> if anyone has a prayer um, about anything that we touched on tonight or a need of the heart or for the world, for yourself, or an animal um, that we've gathered so much light <laughs> that it can be a good time to to say a healing prayer does anyone wish to donna donna 
I would Martha. like to send prayers up for my friend Kathy Crawford, who just had abdominal surgery for colon cancer. And um, I'm just praying for the best outcome. And I thank you for praying with me. Yes. I'm thank placing you. our and I'm placing the healing book with all the names in it in the center of the energy here. Thank you. Beautiful. I'm placing John and Rose for complete healing as they pass through the, the virus and uh, are feeling better today and ask oh, yeah. for the continued complete restoration and healing. Martha, you had something in court? Yes, um, on, on, on the heels of, of the Mother Teresa poem, uh, the homeless poem, is a, just, just a prayer for, for all the lonely hearts of children and of all human beings on this planet to feel the love and the light that's present for us today. Yes. And Thank the, you, um, Martha. Blessed be. Corky, you had something? Yeah, for, for everyone that's on the prayer list for an um, prayer request for universe, for UCM and for the Center for Creative Living and for all people, all prayers that are said and unsaid and um, the healing for everyone, you know, speedy recovery or speedy relief. And thank you so much. And what a wonderful presentation. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I'm so glad we finally got her here. It was wonderful. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Sonia and Sherrod. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. For, and Corey for thank having you. this educational forum. And my friends, you know, just know that we can continue this virtual connection, even beyond this meeting, and we can continue to reach out and support each other and, and in our work of bearing the light forward, carrying the lamp forward. So thank you, Sonia, for opening this up. Thank you, Lynn, for guiding us. And thank you, each and every one of you, for all that you bring. Don't ever forget the power of your light is exactly what is needed. Exactly what is needed right now, yes. right here. Yes. And for those who measure energy, um, they have found that each one of us who carries light as a light worker can actually impact up to 30,000 people. Really? Ooh, I didn't know I that. I love that. Up to 30,000 mm -hmm. people, whether we I see them or not, Sonia, right? Whether we see them or not, just by carrying the light. Mm -hmm. That's oh, beautiful. That's Yes. And Thank you for that. Thank yes. you. Why shouldn't we congregate like this? <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, what did you say? Why shouldn't we feel that this is congregate important? like this? Congregate yes. like this. Yes. Well, whether mm -hmm. anywhere we find ourselves, whether in, com in community, walking alone, we're not alone because we can link to this energy and feel the togetherness of our of common shared light. <clears throat> And thank you, Sonia, for bringing the light across the hemispheres. I, mean, yes. I just love that image. Yes. You know, you are our bridge. And, you know, we um, are assembled, right? That's right. Yes. Absolutely. So be very gentle with yourselves, my friends, as we navigate these challenging times and remember to call upon your lamp, your light, and to bring about, when you're having a rough time, just bring about this image of all of us here together in this yeah. evening. Yeah. Absolutely, we are tipping the critical, critical mass. Yes. Yeah. While there are those who are doing yeah. other things by meeting like this, mm -hmm. we are mm -hmm. tipping the critical mass. I, yes. I just remembered that it was Rudyard Kipling who said, East is East and West is West and the twain shall never meet. And I say, Rudyard Kipling was wrong. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. Beautifully, Beautifully embodied by yes. your bringing an understanding in your very presence that links East and West in, in a very understandable and encouraging way. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes. Thank your you. homework is to be gentle with yourself and do something mm -hmm. bad and decadent that is totally <laughs> to spoil you. Right? Okay. <laughs> I will totally spoil you. In the, in the spirit of festival, to totally spoil you. <clears throat> Something sweet. 
<laughs> something sweet. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Something sweet. Yeah.